So this morning, we're going to continue our prayer series. It's kind of apt, isn't it? Uh, that after praying that we would uh, now open God's Word together uh, and to continue to explore this priority that in the life of a disciple, which we're called to. Remember, that's our theme for this year, this, uh, this path of discipleship, this idea that, that um, Jesus says to people, even who know that he is the Messiah, he says, now come and follow me. Now come and follow me. People who have come to that life-changing recognition of who he is, uh, he says to them, come and follow me. It's throughout the Gospels, and it is a call to you and to me, come and follow me. And part of the, the uh, a core part of that life, this path of discipleship, is our prayer lives. And I would say for many of us, because of life and the busyness and disappointment and a variety of things, prayer is probably not as, as significant a part of our lives as perhaps it should be. And part of the reason I think for that, and we're going to explore this today, is the role that disappointment and confusion uh, can sometimes play in our life and play in our spirit that, that sometimes gets, us in, it gets in the way of, of really seeking God in prayer. This morning, we're going to look at the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And if you are not sure where that is, it is between Nahum and Sephaniah. You'll know where they are, I'm sure. Uh, so that should help you out. But the words are going to be on the screen. I'm actually uh, going to work through quite a lot of the book today. It's only three chapters. It's uh, actually the fourth shortest book in the Old Testament. If you go home not having learnt anything else, you've learnt that. Uh, and so we're actually going to race through this. And I find this book of Habakkuk um, interesting because the name is very unusual. You don't see people calling their babies that name, although Andy and Eden, it's, let's throw that one on the list. You don't see it, uh, it being used. Uh, and the context of the book, which we'll look at this morning, is completely radically different to our experience today. But what I'd say to you is that even though it is different, what Habakkuk faces is so familiar. And we're going to unpack that this morning. He faces a situation, he faces circumstances that make him cry out to God saying, God, where are you? God, why are you not doing anything? Why does it appear that you aren't at work? God, why are you allowing these terrible things to happen? That's Habakkuk's cry. And I would say that many of us go through seasons, and maybe that's your season now, where that is our cry as well. Where we are calling out to God, saying, God, where are you? God, why are you not seemingly at work in my life? And so we're going to unpack this this morning because Habakkuk's story and his prayer that's contained in this book is a picture of hope. It's a picture of joy. And let's pray as we open God's word. God, we pray that as we open your word this morning, Father, that you would reveal yourself to us. We thank you as through your word, uh, Lord, that we understand who you are, Lord God, and we understand how we can connect with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would reveal that to us this morning. Amen. So the story of Habakkuk starts in Habakkuk 1, and we actually don't know uh, too much about him. Uh, he kind of appears in this moment. Uh, we do know what's happening at the time, and that is the southern uh, kingdom of Judah uh, is in real strife. You see, uh, not long before, a uh, king, uh, Josiah, uh, had, had kind of uh, become king at a very young age, and he'd reigned for about 30 years. And during that time, he had sought after God. He had, he had um, purged the kingdom of idols. He had turned the nation back to God. And he dies, uh, as was often the pattern. Uh, they, they go through this period of fairly short-lived kings who, who don't follow God, uh, who don't do what they should be doing, who worship idols. And we see this pattern that as that happens, the kingdom descends into chaos. And while this is occurring, Habakkuk is staring on this man of integrity, is watching this descent. And so in Habakkuk chapter 1, uh, and in verse 2, which will come up on the screen, uh, you might have a heading there that says Habakkuk's complaint. If you've got your own Bible open, that's what you might see. And this is what he says. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to say. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. 
The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Habakkuk's complaint is, God, where are you? God, why would you allow this wickedness to take place? Everywhere I look, there is violence. It is running rampant. There is no justice. And when there is justice, it's perverted. He's seeing this complete um, devastation happen to his nation and to uh, the society around him. And he's crying out to God. And God replies in verse 5, and this is what God says. God says to Habakkuk, look around at the nations, look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. God goes on to say to Habakkuk, I'm raising up the Babylonians. You're not going to believe it, but I'm raising up the Babylonians, a people known for violence and cruelty. I'm raising them up. And they will be an instrument to punish, to hold Judah accountable for its sin. And I love Habakkuk's reply because God says, you wouldn't believe this if someone told you. And Habakkuk's reply is, in effect, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He says, God, why would you use this evil nation to um, bring punishment on, on Judah? Why would you allow us as your people to be conquered? They're going to wipe us out. If you don't do something different to what you've told me, they're going to wipe us out. And this is where Habakkuk brings his second complaint. That might be the heading you've got. It might say burden, but he brings this second complaint because he is so confused. He's called out to God, God, why aren't you doing anything? God says to him, this is what I'm going to do. Habakkuk says, no, God, don't do that. Don't do that. And so he brings this complaint to God. And I love this in the start of chapter 2. Because Habakkuk cries out to God, and then what does he do? It tells us here in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk says, I'll get alone. I'll go to the watchtower. I'll draw aside. And there I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. If you're in a note-taking mood this morning, look, I struggle to take notes um, when I'm listening to people. But there is some, I think, sense in doing it. And I always... Uh, admire those who do it. But if you are taking notes this morning, maybe you could throw this into your phone. It is encouraging for us to see that God is a God who can handle our complaints, that He is a God who is, is happy for us to bring to Him our worries and our troubles and cry out to Him and, and to seek Him in those times. But Habakkuk doesn't just whinge to God, he doesn't just cry out to God, he doesn't just bring this complaint. What does he do? He then draws aside and he waits. And I think we are good at often bringing our complaints to God and not so good at waiting. We're good at speaking, but then not so good at drawing aside and saying, God, what what are you going to say to me? How will you answer my cry? How will you answer my complaint? And so uh, we read in chapter 2 that it says that then, So after Habakkuk has drawn to the side and has waited, that then God answers him in verse 2 and says this, Write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. God says, Habakkuk, I know what I am doing and I want you to write it down so that it will be uh, encouraging for you and encouraging for others, for you and for me, that this, these words would last on because God says, I will do what I have promised to do and my promise is I will never leave you or forsake you, that I will not allow you to be destroyed. And God goes on to say this, and this is the passage that Paul then quotes in the book of Romans, and it is so crucial to the Christian life. In in chapter 2, verse 4, God says to him, look at the proud, look at the Babylonians who think they run the show. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Habakkuk, be a righteous one who lives by faith. Don't live thinking that you you have control, that you can make these things happen, but rather live in faith. And that's the message to us too. 
And so then God goes on throughout the rest of chapter 2, which we're going to skip through. And he says to Habakkuk, don't worry, the Babylonians will come, but I will deal with them. Don't worry, Habakkuk, you need to trust in me. And we get to chapter 3 and we read this prayer of Habakkuk. And it's written in the form of a song and the instructions at the time in the Hebrew say that this song is to be uh, sung in an upbeat, rousing fashion, that this is not a uh, a kind of sad song. This is a song of joy, a song of celebration, a song to be sung. And it is interesting to note that the prophet Habakkuk, who starts in tears with his complaint at the start of this book, now is filled with song. And I want you to notice this this morning because nothing has changed. There is nothing in Habakkuk's circumstances that have changed. We normally think that we cry out to God, all of a sudden everything comes good, that our circumstances are then sorted, everything's sweet, the Babylonians are actually crushed, Uh, the nation of Judah turns back to God, and Habakkuk is sitting there uh, watching all this occur, but that hasn't happened. There is nothing in his circumstances that have changed. Judah is still wicked. There is still violence and injustice. But the Babylonians are still forming on the borders. They are still becoming powerful. They are still getting ready to attack. Uh, Habakkuk knows that Judah is going to fall, that this nation will fall to the Babylonians. And yet his despair has been replaced with song. And there's some key things in this prayer. There's some key things in this prayer this morning that show us how, that are kind of, I would say, the hints or the tips or the truths that we can incorporate in our own prayer life that can turn our sorrow into song, that can turn our weeping into joy. Even if our circumstances haven't changed, they will change our spirit. They will change our heart. And so first off, the first thing that we see in chapter 3 in Habakkuk's a prayer, is that Habakkuk reminds himself of God's greatness. Habakkuk reminds himself of God's greatness. In chapter 2, uh, 3, sorry, verse 2 of chapter 3, we read, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In verse 3, he says, I see God moving across the deserts of Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran, His brilliant splendor fills the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands where his awesome power is hidden. You see, Habakkuk reminds himself of God's greatness. And I'd say to you at the heart of his change is this reminding himself, declaring God is great. God is great. He speaks of Mount Paran. You might know it as Mount Sinai the mountain where the Israelites, as they fled captivity in Egypt, they come and they camp and God descends, his presence descends on the mountain. The very mountain shakes under the, under the glory of God. This is the same mountain that the prophet Elijah runs to in complete despair. And on this mountain, he hears God's voice in a quiet, still whisper. This is the same place And and Habakkuk is reminding himself of God's greatness, this Mount Sinai, this holy mountain. He's reminding himself of his insignificance compared to God, but he's also reminding himself of a place where the Israelites knew that God drew near to his people. He's reminding himself that, that God is not just great and out there, but he is great and right here. And some of you need to hear that this morning that God consistently throughout Scripture is not just great out there, He is great right here. That the God whose splendor fills the heavens also lives through the power of His Holy Spirit within you. That God is the God who draws near to those who are brokenhearted. He draws near to those who are carrying heavy burdens. And what an incredible reminder that it is as soon as we start speaking of God's greatness that we remind ourselves that He is great and He is with us. Habakkuk lifts his eyes in doing that. 
He lifts his eyes and he sees out of his circumstance and all of a sudden his issues look insignificant in the light of God's magnitude. The Babylonians, while they might be the most powerful group nearby, they are nothing compared to God. They're nothing compared to God. The second thing you'll see in his prayer is that he reminds himself, he prays out of God's faithfulness. So he prays about God's greatness and then he prays about God's faithfulness. You see, God's faithfulness is his commitment to do exactly as he has promised. And the great thing about the faithfulness of God is that it's not dependent on our uh, faithfulness because we tend to be a bit hot and cold, don't we? But rather God's Faithfulness is very essence of who he is, which is completely consistent, completely dependable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is faithful to fulfill his promises. In verse 2 of chapter 3, Habakkuk says this, In this time of our deep need, he's praying this, Help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, God, remember your mercy. Habakkuk prays, God, help us again as you did in years gone by. And he spends much of the next 12 verses praying about God's deliverance of the Israelites. He speaks of them fleeing captivity the way that God rescued them from the Egyptians. He speaks of God parting the seas and and releasing them uh, and wiping out the Egyptians. We see this great demonstration of God's power and a reminder of his faithfulness. See, one of the most hope-filling things we can do in our prayer life is to remind ourselves that he is a faithful God. Because when our circumstances seem greater than him, the first thing to go often is our sense of his faithfulness. We start to pray those prayers, the Habakkuk prayer, God, where are you? Why are you not here? Why are you not doing anything? Why are you not keeping your promises? But Habakkuk then goes on to declare that he is a promise-keeping God. And what I'd say to you this morning is, Reminding ourselves of previous instances or previous times when he's been faithful in our lives gives us faith that he will do it again. And maybe you're a fairly new Christian or maybe you've just been in a season of trial for such a long time that you actually can't remember stories of God's faithfulness. You actually can't remember what God has done in your past. And I'd say to you the stories that Habakkuk prays out are 800 years old. He declares God's faithfulness to the Israelites in rescuing them from the Egyptians, something that occurred 800 years before. And so God's word is full of examples of his faithfulness. But the other thing is sometimes in seasons of our life, we have to rely on somebody else's story. We actually have to go to others and say, can I borrow some of your faith? I'm really struggling. I can't see God's faithfulness in this season, but can you speak of God's faithfulness in your life? Because then I'm going to piggyback on the back of your faith. And I know there's been seasons of my life where I've done that, where I've gone to someone and I've said, remind me that story where you spoke about how God came through for you in that really tricky time. And as they tell me this story, I think, God, do it again. Do it for me. Would you come through for me? The other thing that Habakkuk reminds himself is not just God's faithfulness to his promise in the past, but God's faithfulness to his promises in the future. And he says in verse 16, I will wait quietly for the coming day. God, you have said that you will make it right, that you will um, sort out the Babylonians, this evil, cruel nation. I will wait quietly for the coming day. God, you have been faithful to your promises in the past, and I'm going to rely on your faithfulness to the promises that you have made for the future. And can I say God's word is full of promises to you. It is full of his promises to you. And maybe you haven't read them in some time. Maybe you haven't seen them for a while. Maybe they've slipped out of your mind. But get back into his word and look at the promises that he has declared over your life and trust that he is faithful to deliver on them. He will keep his word. And lastly, Habakkuk chooses praise. Pastor James spoke on this last week, and if you missed it, there's a link in the, uh, in the email that was sent out this week. But 
We're just going to touch briefly on it because it was covered so well last week, but Habakkuk chooses praise. So he speaks of God's greatness. He speaks of his faithfulness, and then he chooses to praise. If you look at uh, chapter 3, verse 17, Habakkuk says this, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, even though, God, nothing has changed, even though there is destitution, there is barrenness, there is despair, even though I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. What an incredible thing it is that Habakkuk, having spoken of God's greatness and his faithfulness, now begins to praise God. You see, our circumstances often shape how we see what God is doing. And Habakkuk says, even though I can't understand it, even though there is nothing there, even though, God, you haven't done what I might think that you would do, even then I will praise you. And we see this power of praise throughout Scripture. I mean, we could talk about Paul and Silas in prison, couldn't we, as they begin to praise that the breakthrough comes. But Habakkuk says, God, even though I can't see the results of your promise, even though I can't see the results yet of your greatness, even though those things aren't apparent, I will still rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will still rejoice in the God who has promised that he will set me free. I will still rejoice in you. And when he does this, what occurs? He says, God gives me strength. I become not mired in the mud, not mired in the muck, not confused, not lost anymore, but rather I'm as sure-footed as a deer, that I'm able to tread upon the heights. You see, what is now determining Habakkuk's spirit is no longer his situation because remember, that hasn't changed yet. But what is determining the state of his spirit is God's greatness and God's faithfulness. And what an incredible reminder that is for us. And so I say to you this morning, I wonder if you've had a moment in your life where you felt like it's a Habakkuk moment, where you've cried out to God and you've said, God, where are you? God, why aren't you doing something? God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why haven't you intervened? And I wonder, maybe even that's the question that you're asking this morning. Maybe you're going through that season, that Habakkuk season at the moment, and you're saying, God, where are you? God, why haven't you done something? And there's power here because it reminds us that we can be vulnerable. We can be open with God. We can go to him and know that he will respond in gentleness and compassion, that he hears the cries of our hearts. See, Habakkuk starts this book in complete despair and he finishes it with a song of a prayer. And what an incredible thing that is. You see, his confusion has changed. His despair has changed. He pours out his heart to God, but then he stops and he listens and he waits to hear what God would say to him. And so I want to encourage you this morning. We're going to pray now. And I encourage you that if you are going through that season I'd love to pray with you individually as well. So after we've prayed, uh, there's tea and coffee this morning. Um, and I'd encourage you to stick around uh, and enjoy that. But I'd encourage you, if, if you are going through one of those seasons and you feel, you know what, I could really do some prayer. I'm stuck. My eyes are down and I really want to lift them. I really want to be reminded again of God's greatness. I really want to be reminded again of God's faithfulness. I, I'd love to pray, pray with you. Let's pray together this morning. God, we... Thank you that your word remains true. And Lord, it reminds us it is so full of richness to remind us of just how great you are. And Lord, we just take a moment this morning that you are the God who spoke and the world came into being. Lord God, that you are sovereign, that, that you are uh, able to conquer and defeat the worst circumstances. Lord God, that there is no place we could go where you don't see us. Lord God, where your hand isn't stretched towards us. And so, Lord, we just 
we just think this morning, we, we look at the, the skies, the heavens, the earth. We look at what we're surrounded with, nature, uh, wildlife, the things that sing your praises. And we marvel at how great you are. And Lord, we thank you that you are a great God who is here with us. Lord God, that you are a faithful God, that you have been faithful in the past, Father, that we can look at your word and we can see example after example after example of your faithfulness. Lord God, but you, you have declared promises over us as well, that you are, you are not just faithful in the past and now absent, but you were faithful then and you will be faithful now because it is the very nature of who you are. And so God, we ask again that you would act, Father, particularly in the lives of those this morning who are in that Habakkuk season. Father, we look to you and we again say, God, you have done it in the past. Would you do it now? Lord God, would you show yourself on our behalf? Would you lift our eyes because of your faithfulness? And Lord God, in knowing how great you are and how faithful you are, Father, we choose to praise. Lord, in these seasons, and perhaps it was the same for Habakkuk, praise is the last thing that we want to do. Lord, we want to grumble. Lord, we want to uh, wallow in despair. Lord God, but instead this morning, Lord, we draw a line in the sand and we choose to praise you. Lord, we, we, we declare that your praise will be on our lips, that when the enemy uh, starts speaking into our life, starts speaking words of doubt, starts speaking words of deceit, Lord God, instead we choose to praise you. Because in doing that, Lord, that you fill us with strength. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that as we commit over these coming weeks to prayer, Lord God, that you would do something mightily in our life, that we would hear from you. Father, that you would remind us to not just speak, but Lord, draw aside and wait on you to open up your word and to remind ourselves of your goodness and your promises. And we pray these things in your name.